Welcome to EPG Patshala. In this lesson, we shall deal with the Duchess of Malfi by John Webster. The lesson has been written by Shalini Srinivasan, a PhD scholar in the Department of English, University of Hyderabad. My name is Mohan Ramanan. I am a retired professor of English from the same department. The first section will be about the Jacobians and their drama because Webster was a Jacobian dramatist. The Jacobian world is the title of the first section. With the death of Elizabeth I in 1603, the English throne passed to James I. Jacobian, James in the Latin is Jacob. Jacobian period in English literature lasted through the reign of James I up till 1625. Jacobian drama, therefore, is contiguous with and grew out of the flourishing Elizabethan theatre. Some of Shakespeare's later plays, like Macbeth, for example, are technically Jacobian, not Elizabethan. The Jacobian theatre tradition was indebted to the theatrical innovations of Shakespeare and his generation. Its theatre had a flexible voice that ranged from broad satire to bloody revenge tragedies of the kind Webster would become synonymous with. The historical events of James I's reign marked several turning points in English history. For one, James was already the King of Scotland when he was crowned in England. England and Scotland were unofficially united by James's coronation to both the thrones. Under James, imperialism continually rampant and the first British colonies in America were founded and settled. Domestically, the English Renaissance was a period of great growth but also of political unrest. Under Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, the much married king, England had broken away from the Roman Catholic Church. The new Church of England had the English monarch as its head. He was defender and protector of the crown and the church. And the persecution of Catholics who continued to owe spiritual allegiance to Rome gave this period a very large amount of visibility. The repercussions of this were felt through the reigns of Elizabeth I and James I. On the one hand, James gives his name to the now standard translation or version of the Bible called the Authorized Version or the King James Version. On the other, it was during his reign that on the 5th of November 1605, a group of Catholics led by Guy Fawkes tried to blow up Parliament with the King in it. London, where Webster lived all his life, was the center of Jacobian political and mercantile politics. It was perhaps not surprising that the theatre of the time was an important player in both political and commercial terms. Royalty kept a jealous eye on the theatre. The names of the theatre groups were the King's Group, for example, indicate that their chief patron was the King. On the other, its sheer popularity made it a money-making enterprise. Fledgling colonialism was beginning to effect changes in the kinds of settings and characters used. Students, we have so far seen something about the Jacobian world. We shall now discuss the language of the Jacobian theatre because this was a period when the English language was coming into its own with Shakespeare and his contemporaries. In this environment, Elizabethan and Jacobian English was a language undergoing rapid development and expansion. Playwrights coined new terms. Shakespeare is credited to have contributed more than a hundred words to the language, in addition to expanding the usage of hundreds of extant ones. And he adapted old ones to suit the new occasion. 
sentiments, phrases, sometimes entire lines could be borrowed from older writings. The Latin classics, in the case of writers like Johnson and Chapman, street slang or local dialects in the plays of Middleton, Decker and Fletcher, terms borrowed from different fields like alchemy, geography, law, metaphysics, and also dealt with uh, uh, metaphysics and the court. The ambiguous nature of the words made the Elizabethan stage full of puns and other kinds of dexterous verbal play. Older poetic devices of alliteration and allusion were also in use. The wide open nature of the language meant that the writers developed their own idiosyncrasies, their own syntax and their own meanings. And they weren't above using each other's structures and lines and borrowing from other writers quite shamelessly. This flexibility of language also meant a flexibility of form. Plays often mixed verse and prose. For example, the Duchess of Malfi, which is the focus of our lesson, does that eminently well. The verse is also stable, uh, also variable. Blank verse is popular. Poetry can take the form of a couplet or stanzas or lyrics which are set to music. And in the scene when the Duchess is about to be strangled, for example, the Duchess's speech is poetic and some of the lines even rhyme. We shall now move on, students, after having discussed the language of the Jacobian theatre, to some other aspects of Elizabethan and Jacobian drama. Elizabethan drama is at the cusp of the Renaissance, at the medieval allegorical plays and miracle plays, and characters were types and humours gave way to a more complex humanist theatre with characters who functioned as distinct individuals. The elaborate moral messages of those earlier plays gave way to nuanced plots and characters. With the Jacobians, this theatre became more formalised and polished. Some of Shakespeare's most complex plays, including King Lear and The Tempest, were written during the Jacobian period. Among Webster's contemporaries were Ben Jonson, John Marston, George Chapman, Thomas Middleton, John Fletcher and Francis Beaumont. The political events of the time did leave their mark upon the theatre. Alan Sinfield, for example, reads in Shakespeare's Macbeth a reflection of several contrasting Jacobian ideas, for example, the nature of power and kingship, who deserves to rule, how power is to be maintained. And The Tempest is frequently regarded as amongst the earliest of colonial texts because there we have Caliban confronting Prospero. Popular playwrights of the time could usually turn their hand at various genres, like historical plays, comedies, satires, and of course, tragedies. Many of the older theatrical forms, like miracle plays, coexisted with this new plot-driven drama. Pageants and masks were also very popular. Masks were usually designed for specific occasions. They were elaborate setups and ended with the entrance of the king or queen taking their rightful place in the court, establishing order. Many playwrights incorporated elements of these into their plays. In The Tempest, Prospero conjures up a full-scale mask within the play. Other dramas also incorporated music and dancing and even funeral processions. Clowns and dumb shows often found a place in the theatre as well, giving the audience a change of pace between emotionally heightened or poetically taxing scenes. Playwrights sometimes use these forms for macabre effect. And in The Mask of the Madman, in The Duchess of Malfi, or the mournful song that precedes the Duchess's murder. We shall now move from this consideration of Elizabethan and Jacobian drama to revenge tragedies, which were an important aspect of Jacobian theatre. Tragedies of all kinds were popular in the Elizabethan period and in the Jacobian theatre, but revenge tragedies occupied a specific and blood-soaked niche. In a world where public whippings and beheadings were still common, revenge tragedies, however gruesome, were a favourite among the Jacobian audience. 
They were first popularized by Thomas Kidd in the Spanish tragedy, which is thought to have been composed in the 1580s or 1590s. Cyril Tonier's The Atheist's Tragedy and Thomas Middleton's The Revenger's Tragedy set the pattern for the genre. Marston's Antonio's Revenge was another popular Jacobian revenge play. The plays contrived to close in on their villain over the course of the narrative, hoisting him on his own petard. Jacobian and Elizabethan dramatists often drew upon the work of the Roman playwright Seneca for their revenge plays. Seneca's stoic philosophy sometimes influences the behavior of the protagonist. The Duchess of Malfi's calmness and fatalism in the face of her misfortunes are diametrically opposed to her brother Ferdinand's reactions when faced with their deaths. Bersola too, by the end of the play, talks of his fundamental inability to control his own fate, much as he would like to. As in Webster's plays, the Italian court was a common setting for, for elaborate plots that were moved forward by overweening ambition and lust, and ended with most of the characters violently dead at the end of the play. Think of Hamlet, for example, where everybody is dead at the end of the play. The opulence and sophistication of courtly life set off the lurid and primitive violence of the characters. This setting also allowed the playwrights to question the pillars of the feudal state, the corruption of court life, the greed of the nobility that would have been impossible if its subjects were closer home. Webster's revenge plays, The White Devil and The Duchess of Malfi, both have a basis in history. The horrors in The Duchess of Malfi are subtler than those of the older revenge tragedies. Reflections, visions, echoes and imaginings are you know, uh, dominant in this play. In the second unit of this lesson, we shall now move on to a consideration of our chief dramatist and the focus of this unit, which is John Webster, who seems to have been born in 1580, but probably died in 1634. The dates are not very, very clear. Not much, therefore, is known of Webster's life. Even his date of birth is a conjecture. What is known is that by 1602, Webster was sufficiently established as a playwright to be working with several well-regarded theatre people, amongst them Thomas Decker, Thomas Middleton and Michael Drayton. In 1604 and 1605, along with Thomas Decker, he produced two satirical comedies. One is called Westward Ho, the other is called Northward Ho. Westward Ho was well received, enough to inspire you know, uh, competitive dramatic activity amongst Ben Johnson and George Chapman, who were inspired enough to write an equally satirical reply. And John Marston's Eastward Ho is supposed to be uh, an answer to Westward Ho. The three playwrights were thrown in jail because of some of the play's anti-Scottish remarks and this offended the king, James I, giving it even greater notoriety. Northward Ho was Decker and Webster's answer to all this. Webster was thought to be, at the time, Decker's junior partner in writing these plays. Webster began to make his own reputation over the next few years, notably with two plays for which he is best remembered, The White Devil, 1612, The Duchess of Malfi, 1614, both dark and brooding tragedies. The White Devil was first performed by the Queen's Men at the Red Bull Theatre in 1612, but did not fare too well. And this, of course, led to immense disappointment in Webster. The White Devil's plot is based on the murder and trial of a 16th century Italian lady named Vittoria Accoramboni. In Webster's hands, the murder becomes a part of a corrupt and sinister world where violence lurks constantly. The Duchess of Malfi was presented by the King's Men in 1613 or 1614 in the outdoor public theatre, The Globe, and the indoor venue, Blackfriars. Unlike its predecessor, 
It was instantly popular and has been frequently revived in performance ever since. Based on historical events, it took its plot from an episode in William Painter's Palace of Pleasure, 1567, to which Webster added a lot more. Next, he is thought to have written a play called The Guise, which has been lost. Webster's last individual play was The Devil's Law Case, performed by the Queen's Men around 1619. As with the White Devil, Webster used his knowledge of the law and of trial scenes to great and great to great effect. After that, he collaborated on a few more plays, including the late murder of the son upon the mother with Decker, Ford and Rowley, a cure for a cuckold with Haywood and others, and a pageant called Monuments of Honor. Webster married Sarah Peniel, and their eldest son John was born in 1606. He is thought to have had at least five children. He seems to have had a parallel business as a, as a, as a businessman, as a merchant, along with his play, playwriting abilities. In other words, he was able to combine solid business activity with theatrical activity, and the two were not seen as mutually exclusive. In module 3, we shall go on to a summary of the entire play. But what I shall do is to only summarize Act 1 and leave you to read from the e-book which is available Acts 2, 3, 4 and 5 in detailed summary done by Shalini Srinivasan. Act 1. The play opens with Antonio, the Duchess's steward, returning from France. He is greeted by his friend Delio. Their conversation lays out the theme that will be picked up and refined over the course of the play. The idea of nobility, the role of the royal court. Antonio compares it to a common fountain that sets the tone of the people of the kingdom. Antonio himself is a commoner. Next we meet Basola, who is immediately identified as unpleasant and the cardinal, one of the duchess's brothers. Their mutual contempt established, the cardinal exists, leaving Basola to describe him and his brother Ferdinand as crooked and evil but rich and powerful. Bosola's speech is delivered in choppy prose, echoing the suppressed violence of his words. When he leaves, Delio tells Antonio that Bosola spent seven years in the galleys for murdering someone on the cardinal's orders. The duchess's other brother, her twin Ferdinand, the Duke of Calabria, appears next. He is accompanied by some other courtiers and attendants including Castruccio. If the cardinal is short and brusque, Cardinal Ferdinand is shown to be both humorless and inclined to expect his courtiers to be his toadies. Laugh when I laugh, he says. It's only now that after the other characters have been established, the, we, meet, we meet the Duchess. With her are Cariola, her waiting woman, and Julia, who is married to Castruccio, and the cardinal's mistress. The duchess agrees to hire Basola as the master of the horse in her court as soon as she leaves. We find Ferdinand hiring him to spy on her. When Ferdinand gives him money, Basola's reply is full of self-loathing. Whose throat must I cut? He asks. The parallels between Antonio and Basola run throughout the play. Like Antonio, Basola is a commoner who depends upon the nobility for his living. They are both independent minded and full of political opinions. But while Antonio has been lucky to be employed by a lady he admires and values and with whom he builds a family eventually, Basola must earn his money and try for a place in the world from masters whom he dislikes and mistrusts. Ferdinand and the Cardinal take their leave of the Duchess with a long speech against any idea of her remarrying. They speak alternately, barely allowing her to reply, finishing each other's lines with vehemence before the cardinal goes off. Faced with only her twin, that is Ferdinand, the Duchess remarks, I think this speech between you both was studied. It came so roundly off. 
when they leave, the Duchess, perhaps on the spur of the moment, perhaps not, decides to get married and confides this to her waiting woman, Cariola. When Antonio enters, the Duchess banters with him, woos him and asks him to marry her. Antonio is hesitant because of his inferior social standing. Oh, my unworthiness, he exclaims, but is soon overcome by the Duchess's enthusiasm. He tries to pull back one last time, asking about her brothers. The Duchess dismisses them, drawing a firm line between her private life and her public life. And this is how she puts it. Do not think of them. All discord without this circumference is only to be pitied and not feared. Yet should they know it, time will easily scatter the tempest. Antonio's reply emphasizes how the traditional gender roles are reversed in their relationship and will continue to be. These words should be mine, he notes, but gives in with Cariola as witness, the Duchess and Antonio agree to be married and the words are legally binding. They banter back and forth using various images like the spheres, soft music, loving palms and so on to describe their love. The act ends with Cariola, who fears what the Duchess's impulsive behavior will lead to and pities her. Students, this is a summary of Act 1. And as you can see, all the major characters have been introduced in this act. Now the stage is set for the working out of the plot to its bloody, revengeful end. I shall now move on to a discussion of the characters of this play. And this is the fifth section of the lesson. The Duchess is our first character. She is a historical character based on Giovanna de Aragona. But in the play, she is only referred to by her public persona, by the fact that she holds a political position as the Duchess of Malfi. There is that immortal line when, at one point, faced with a challenge, she says, I am Duchess of Malfi still. In the scene in her bedroom, early in the play, we see the Duchess bantering and laughing with Antonio and Cariola, the family she has made for herself. As soon as she finds herself with Ferdinand, who is holding a poignard, the tonal shift from intimate self-doubt to public dignity is immediate. The Duchess takes the poignard from him, saying, "'Tis welcome, for know whether I am doomed to live or die, I can both do like a prince." The Duchess comes across as a woman who knows her own mind and follows it needless of the, heedless of the consequences. She stands her ground with her brothers at every step, treating the cardinal's chilly manipulation and Ferdinand's hot rages with equal composure. In a sense, she is better at her job being a noble than either of her brothers. She has the calm self-conviction missing in Ferdinand and the wit and generosity missing in the cardinal. In her interactions with Antonio, it is always the duchess who takes the lead, makes decisions arranges matters. It is she who proposes to marry Antonio, overcomes her worries and arranges for Cariola to witness the marriage. It is she who insists on secrecy when her brothers find out in a reversal of conventional gender roles, she sends Antonio away to safety while she faces her enemies. The next character is Basola. Basola is introduced to the audience as an unpleasant person deprived, envious, a man who rails at those things which he wants. Persola's attitude towards the nobility is compounded of envy for their fortune, dislike for their subsequent power over him, hunger for their position, financial stability and prestige. Like Antonio, he is a commoner. Unlike Antonio, he has served masters who are corrupt and ungrateful. When the play opens, he has already served years as a galley slave for murdering someone at the cardinal's behest. His dislike for the cardinal is palpable, but as someone with neither money nor connections in the court, he needs a patron, and Ferdinand and cardinal are the only people he knows as patrons. So he falls in with their plans to spy on the duchess. Persola's growing horror with the events 
unfold and they run parallel with this growing admiration for the duchess when she is imprisoned he asks ferdinand to stop tormenting her basolo's guilt over spying on and deceiving the duchess is made literal when he refuses to let her see him first he covers his face with the visor later he disguises himself when basolo accidentally kills antonio whom he wanted to protect he seems to come to some kind of fatalistic peace akin to the duchess's he finally throws off all his longings for power and his desire for honor and recognition i will not imitate things glorious he says no more than base i'll be my own example his actions when dying reflects his new attitude he blames the circumstances but is no longer railing and embittered by them as he was at the beginning of the play letting the nobles know the whole story and his role in it after basola we shall go on to cariola catherine belsi has remarked that in the 17th century close servants could be treated as family basola and cariola parallel each other in this respect and of course cariola does it in a more unobtrusive fashion she is paid for her job but she is also the duchess's closest friend she is forthright in her opinions more so than antonio who obeys the duchess with less argumentation cariola witnesses her secret wedding and stands by her through thick and thin when all her family has been taken from her it is cariola who remains with the duchess intending perhaps to stay with her till her death until basola has her removed she is the only sane person in the play who faces death less philosophically more practically she fights when faced with death she fights struggles argues protests to save the duchess and later to save herself she neither cries for help like the cardinal nor does she seem resigned and calm like the duchess after cariola we shall move on to antonio who is the first person we meet in the play he is a commoner and his reflections upon the effect the court has on the people on the importance of a ruler who recognizes and accepts good counsel are the reflections of one who stands outside and is in the role of an advisor it is through him that we realize that basola's thirst for social acceptance makes him corruptible and that the cardinal is dangerous antonio seems content to take on a passive role in his relationship with the duchess he follows where she leads keeping the marriage which would greatly enhance his social status completely secret and even play acting his own corruption and dismissal from her household his behavior is completely selfless and always pacific to the very end he is willing to make peace with the duchess's brothers apparently forgiving them the behavior that led to his dismissal from malfi the ejection of his family and then the separation from them from it his manner of dealing with death is as stoic as his wife's when he hears that she and his children are dead he accepts his own end almost gladly antonio's final speech is philosophical and poetic in all our quest of greatness like wanton boys whose pastime is their care we follow the bubbles blown in the air as he lived he dies with concern for someone else that is odilio and his eldest son ferdinand even though 3 years have passed since the duchess's secret marriage and she has born three children ferdinand finds frenzied wrath the only response to it and it's never abated he seems to consider his twin as an extension of himself and his mental turmoil is that of someone whose own self has betrayed them modern readings of the play tend to see his obsession with his sister as partly incestuous incestuous or not ferdinand's obsessive tormenting of his sister is accompanied by an equally obsessive refusal to see her sight is important for ferdinand he needs the duchess to see her ring on a dead man's hand just as he wants her to see the corpses of her family after refusing to see her face for so long when he finally sees her dead body he is both drawn to it and overcome by it cover her face mine eye dazzles 
She died young, he says. This site provides the impetus for Ferdinand to turn on Bosola. It is now too that he develops the symptoms that his doctor calls lycanthropy. He thinks he is a wolf. He digs up corpses. He barely knows his own brother, stabbing him and Basola in a frenzy. Ferdinand's obsessive madness makes him a less villainous creature than his brother, the cardinal. He lacks the self-command to stop himself committing his crimes and the self-awareness to know the implications of what he does. Ferdinand's brother, the cardinal, is the other character. He is the eldest of the three siblings, but the cardinal is the most closed and reserved of the three. Like the duchess, he preserves a calm exterior even when he is truly angry or agitated. He is like a good renaissance prince. Unlike her, however, when he finds himself faced with death, he is panic stricken. He cries for help, bribing everyone who is listening with his dukedom. For someone who, who was and now is again a soldier, it is striking behavior. Of the three siblings, it is Cardinal who is ironically, given that he is a priest, the most worldly. He is concerned with money, with temporal power, with political maneuverings. His anger with the sister is purely political. He wants her in a marriage which will bring him additional power, money and connections. His reaction is to want Antonio killed. His solution to the problem is also political. He uses his clout to get his sister and her family evicted from Ancona and his position in the church to remove her wedding ring and nullify her marriage. There is nothing spiritual or godly about him and this leads to the logical conclusion when he uses his Bible to poison his mistress. Towards the end he remarks, I would pray now but the devil takes away my heart for having any confidence in prayer. His religion is completely gone, physically put on his armor and now wholly when even prayer is impossible to him. Indeed it is debatable whether he ever had any religion at all since we learn earlier that he was a soldier before he joined the church. His greed for estates, his breaking of the vow of celibacy in his affair with Julia and his abuse of power in all his dealings with the sister and Brasola make the cardinal a completely corrupt figure. Thus far students, we have looked at characters and we have dealt with most of the important characters of the play. In the sixth section, we shall deal with the important themes of this play. The themes of the Duchess of Malfi intersect and crisscross with each other, creating a complex moral world. If the Duchess's brothers see pity as incommensurate with being powerful, the Duchess seems to posit it as an obligation to be followed by one who is powerful. Basola, who scorns to pity anyone at the beginning of the play, finds that he has come round to the Duchess's point of view. Decay and corruption are also bound with the other themes. Power corrupts, but madness too is a kind of corruption of the mind. So we shall talk about power, corruption and nobility now. The spring in his face is nothing but the engendering of toads, says Antonio of the Cardinal in the very first act. He judges that the Cardinal's corruption is so deeply entrenched that it decays and ruins all he does everyone he comes in contact with. Power allows Ferdinand and the Cardinal to judge and kill their sister and her entire family with no repercussions from the outside world. A thirst for power is also what drives Basola to take employment with them, even though he hates them. For Basola, power is merely the ability to be in charge of his own self and his own future. For Ferdinand and the Cardinal, Power implies absolute control over everybody they encounter, whether it is their sister, her estates, churchmen in Ancona, Julia, various nobles and servants. Ethical considerations never trouble either of them. Their power has corrupted them absolutely. As Lord Acton put it, absolute power corrupts absolutely. They appear to conflate their power, their position as nobility as justifying each other. 
Basola, on the contrary, hesitates at every juncture. He speaks up for Antonio's honesty, defends the Duchess to Ferdinand, and eventually decides to forget his quest for power and do what he considers to be the right thing. The Duchess's nobility is of a very different kind from her brother's. If Ferdinand's sole criteria for nobility is blood, the Cardinal's seems to be power. Instead, her treatment of Cariola and Antonio is in sharp contrast to her brother's conversations with all those they consider their dependents and social inferiors. She is friendly, confiding, warm, and she is repaid amply by their affection and loyalty. It is to be noted that all the characters are introduced to us via Antonio, who is a commoner. He, his ideas and opinions color the audience's reading of the characters, and his enthusiastic praise of the Duchess as sweet, divine, virtuous makes the reader predisposed to like her. The next theme is that of the family. Catherine Belsey notes that there are two constructions of the family in the Duchess of Malfi at odds with each other. The Duchess sees family as a private realm, one which she is free to create for herself, populating it with those she loves and trusts. Her marriage to Antonio is constructed as an act of private romantic love. They don't even have it conducted by the church. They keep it secret wholly between themselves and their closest friends like Cariola. The Duchess takes her role as a mother seriously. Her last words to Cariola are to ask her to mind her children. Though she has been told they are dead, they are still on her mind. Ferdinand the Cardinal, in contrast, sees the Duchess's marriage as a social and political act which concerns her entire family. The Cardinal's rage is centered on the fact that he has had no influence whatsoever on her choice. Ferdinand seems to see it even more personally as a betrayal of a body he regarded as almost his own. They are twins after all. He can't rest until he has destroyed her. When Ferdinand sees the Duchess's corpse, he is suddenly overwhelmed. In bitter irony, he takes recourse to the justice system he and his brother have ignored and overruled right through the play. Was I her judge? He asks, going on to demand, demand what law, what jury sentenced her to death. Ferdinand's construction of the family we see again is deeply flawed. While the blood they shared flowed in her, he viewed the Duchess as his property to marry her off, imprison, torture her as he wished. Now that she is dead and the domestic life she staked so much on destroyed, he sees her as a citizen who is subject to the public laws. It's too late, of course, for both of them. Ferdinand loses his mind completely. It's only at the end, when he's dying, that Ferdinand remem remembers himself a little, still blaming the Duchess for everything. And this is what he says. My sister, oh my sister, there's the cause on it. Whether we fall by ambition, blood or lust, like diamonds we are cut with our own dust. The next theme after family is madness, which runs throughout the play. It is first suggested when Cariola terms the Duchess's marriage to Antonio madness. Given her brother's reactions, her insistence on keeping it secret and on not enlisting guards and nobles to her side is problematic. However, the Duchess's mistake is not in her madness, which is just impulsiveness, but in her underestimation of the violence of her brother's reactions. The news of the Duchess having borne a child shocks Ferdinand's into incoherence. His brother attempts to stem him, but Ferdinand is determined, I'll find scorpions to string my whips and fix her in a general eclipse, he says. This determination to finish her off is of course the only way in which he can find any meaning for himself. When the Duchess is imprisoned, a sane, reasonable behavior only enrages him further. It is as if he expects his twin to share his mental state. It is with this in mind that he arranges for the mask of madmen. Many of these are mad because they were disappointed in what they thought was reasonable. The astrologer predicts a day of doom and when it does not occur, he goes mad. 
The tailor is driven insane by new fashions, a farmer by problems transporting his grain. Their ravings have to do with the jobs that they do that they do and give them identity. The astrologer talks of doomsday, for example, the doctor about his apothecary. Like Ferdinand's assumption that his twin will be exactly like him, these are people who think themselves experts at something, only to find that their knowledge and expertise mean nothing whatsoever in the world after all. Ferdinand's claiming to Basola that he killed the Duchess because he wanted her lands, which all his prior ravings tender, patently untrue, seems to be his final attempt to prove to himself that his actions are governed by reason. After that, his mind is entirely overthrown. Ferdinand's lycanthropy is not this kind of madness. It seems to be of a completely different order, destroying his identity and his sense of self. Ferdinand comes to think that he is a different species, entirely putting himself completely beyond reason. The final theme of this play, of course, is vengeance versus pity. The Duchess of Malfi isn't a revenge play in the traditional sense, in that no one is actually wronged until much later in the play. Even then, those who consider themselves wronged, Ferdinand and the Cardinal, set out to take vengeance, are themselves committing the crime. The objects of their vengeance are completely innocent. In the very end, Basola is a person who calls for revenge, spurred on by his role in the death of the Duchess and her children. The fact that he himself has killed them, even if under orders, is not something he sees as standing between him becoming Antonio's ally. In this blood-soaked atmosphere, pity is alien, it's a weakness. When Basola begs Ferdinand to release his sister, the former sneers by saying, Thy pity is nothing of kin to thee. His use of the word kin with pity reminds us that the object of Basola's pity is Ferdinand's kin, his closest kin, his own sister. In fact, Ferdinand, if anyone, should be feeling pity for her, which he does not. In the next scene, when Basola shows Ferdinand the strangled children, he lobs the word back at him, saying, But here begin your pity. Ferdinand's reply is cold, foreshadowing his descent into animality. The death of young wolves is never to be pitied, he says. Basola goes looking for Antonio in the hope of avenging the Duchess. Antonio is the very next scene is contemplating taking his son to visit the Cardinal. He and Delio fondly imagining that the child's innocence will inspire the Cardinal to compassion. He is killed by his would-be ally on the way. In the end, Webster's message is bleak. Chaotic vengeance carries the day, commemorated by Basolo's long litany of the dead and their respective killers. Thank you. Students, we have now had a fairly good exposure to John Webster's The Duchess of Malfi. We saw how it was part of the Jacobian theatre. We dealt with the aspects of the Jacobian theatre, which are salient. And we showed how Webster's play is part of the revenge tragedy tradition. We discussed the play in some detail. I gave you a summary of Act 1. And Shalini Srinivasan's e-text will give you a, sa a summary of the other acts. After which we talked about the major characters and finally ended up by dealing with the important themes which this play embodies. I hope you have profited and enjoyed this lesson. Thank you.